Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bill Weiner, and I want to welcome you to the 21st consecutive induction meeting of the Hall of Fame of Lead Leaders and Legends in the Blindness Field. To me, and probably to many of you, this is a very special part of the annual meeting. It's the time when we really get to recognize the best of the best. Today, we have the honor of inducting two outstanding individuals into the Hall of Fame. Dr. Kay Farrell and Ms. Tricia Zorn Hudson. Both are being inducted. Kay was a leader in early intervention and in parent advocacy, a highly regarded professor and a researcher who has laid the foundation for child development of children with visual impairment. In fact, I often find myself quoting her in the classes that I teach. <laughs> Tricia was a Paralympic swimmer for 24 years, a teacher of disabled children, an activist, and a role model for so many. Kay and Tricia have led the way where others have followed. It's indeed an honor to include both of them with the trailblazers who have shaped our fields. Each inductee is honored by a plaque developed by the talented artist Andrew Dakin. Andrew, if you're here, would you stand up? Okay, there we go. Andrew does an outstanding job of creating an uncanny likeness of each individual. And the, the plaque itself goes to each honoree and also, of course, goes to the Hall of Fame. As chairperson of the Board of Governors, I want to recognize the board that I represent. The, vo the board consists of three other officers, Mike Bina, vice chair, Bernadette Kappen, Secretary, and Justin Gardner, Treasurer. Additional board members include Bob Brasher, Carol Frankenkoff, Julie Hapeman, Lee Nassahi, and Ma Mark Reichert. In addition, Jim Deramek serves as the past chair, and Michael Hudson is the curator of the hall. And I want to mention that Jim Deramick has been fantastic. Over many years, he's served the hall, and he has really been instrumental in helping us in the development of policy. And Mike Hudson does an outstanding job as curator, uh, safeguarding the interests of the hall and attending to its needs. I would be amiss if I didn't also mention uh, Bob Brasher. Bob Brasher was one of the original uh, curators of the hall and now is on the board of the hall and contributes much time and energy to the hall. But I especially want to thank all of the board members for their work in choosing tonight's honorees. I also want to extend a special welcome to any former inductees who may be in the audience and to the family and friends of those individuals who are being honored tonight. Now, before we learn more about the two honorees, I would first like to tell you a little bit about the Hall of Fame. The mission of the Hall of Fame states the following. The Hall of Fame for Leaders and Legends of the Blindness Field is dedicated to preserving, honoring, and promoting the tradition of excellence manifested by specific individuals inducted into the Hall of Fame and through the history of outstanding services provided to people who are blind and visually impaired. The Hall of Fame began in 2001 at the 133rd Annual Meeting of APH. It actually sprang from work that was provided at the AER International Conference in Denver Four individuals were responsible. 
Mike Nelipovich, Rod Kosick, John Maxson, and Dean Tuttle. They presented on 32 heroes and pioneers in our field. They created poster-sized representations of the pioneers, and they gave presentations about all of their accomplishments. This really was the catalyst for the Hall of Fame. And recognizing the need for a permanent uh, home for individuals who have been recognized, it was Tuck Tinsley, then CEO of APH, uh, who dedicated space for the Hall of Fame in the 1926 wing of the APH building. The hall was granted a charter, and that charter established us as an independent organization administered by a governing board. Yes, we're housed here at APH, but really the hall belongs to all of us, belongs to you. We're self-supporting, and we generate our own funding through generous sponsorships, through donations, and from the sale of stones of various sizes which make up the Wall of Tribute. The Wall of Tribute gives us all an opportunity to recognize those who have made a difference in our lives and in the lives of others. And we can honor those individuals by in ordering stones and inscribing their names on those stones in recognition of their accomplishments. So together, the hall holds the history of our field through the inductees and through those honored on the wall of tribute. Now, how do people get inducted into the hall? Individuals may be selected each year for induction into the hall by the Board of Governors. Each fall, an announcement goes out to the field inviting in individuals to nominate those who are worthy of induction. And persons are nominated who have made significant contributions to improve the lives of those who are blind and visually impaired in the following areas. Professional practice, research, writing, direct service, leadership, and in their professional organizations. Persons are eligible five years after departure from positions in which they contributed the major bulk of their work. Individuals from North America are eligible for nomination. So let me extend to each of you an invitation to nominate someone who you think is worthy of induction into the Hall of Fame. Nominations are submitted through a nomination packet, and that includes the packet itself, a special form, and three letters uh, that supply support. And for those of you who are interested in making a nomination, Mike Hudson always makes his office available to help with the research in putting that packet together. <laughs> Nomination, nominations for next year will begin later in the fall and will close at the end of April. The Board of Governors then convenes to consider each of the nominees. Now this year will be particularly eventful for the Hall. At the close of January, the physical home of the Hall itself will close. And it will make way for a new installation that's going to be opening in 2024. Cross my fingers. The new home will be located in a new addition to the building right off the main lobby. It'll be a main travel artery, and it'll be adjacent to highly traveled areas, such as the changing exhibits gallery and the fac factory tour assembly station. And this is going to give even greater visibility to the hall than it's had in the past. The exact design of the hall uh, is still in the development stage at this point in time. So now it's time for us to honor our new inductees. 
And I would like to introduce Stuart Wittenstein, who was the chief nominator of Kay Farrell. Dr. Wittenstein completed his doctorate at Teachers College under Kay Farrell's mentorship. His career spans 41 years, during which time he taught children for 17 years, administered schools for the blind for 24 years, and retired in 2014 after 18 years as superintendent of the California School for the Blind. Stuart will be telling us about Kay. Stuart. Thank you, Bill. Um, as you heard 20 years ago, the first 32 members of the hall were inducted, and uh, 10 were here in person. And one of the most memorable things uh, was listening to those 10 folks as they responded to being inducted into a Hall of Fame. And what, what nearly all of them said were, I was just trying to do good work for my kids for my clients. I didn't expect this kind of recognition. And uh, they really were humble like that and amazed at the honor. And it was amazing to have them all in the same room at the time, too. Now, there was one exception to the humble speech. Um, one, of the, um, one of the inductees, when he looked at his plaque, which if you haven't seen them, it's a beautiful bas-relief of the person's face, a portrait in bronze. He said, well, I've been stoned before, but I've never been bronzed. <laughs> uh, um, Kay, was, uh, Kay was nominated by three of her former students, Madeline Millian and Julie Durando, and I worked together on that. And, um, we want to thank the Board of Governors for recognizing Kay's contributions, which made her a natural choice for induction. It seemed natural to us. We were glad they agreed with us. Uh, we also want to thank some people for beautiful letters of support, uh, including two Hall of Famers themselves, Dean Tuttle and Kathy Eubner, and also Diane Wormsley and George Zimmerman. And um, if you saw the the announcement from APH uh, of K that lists all of Kay's accomplishments and positions she held, that was from George Zimmerman's letter of support. He did a great job of listing all those, and I'm not going to do that today. I, I, first of all, I don't have time, and you want to hear from Kay, but I want to talk a little bit about why, why Kay is, an, is a natural selection for the Hall of Fame. It, it seems to me that a lot of people had good, solid careers, but some people saw specific needs, found creative ways to try to, to, try to push us forward and, uh, and bring those ideas to help our clientele and, um, and to make our profession stronger. And Kay is one such person. Um, as you heard Bill say, she's well known as a researcher, as, a, as a, an expert in early childhood development, and she did um, a, a longitudinal study called Project PRISM that taught us a lot about the development of children with or, and without disabilities. And, um, and, she, and she also ta taught us through that the demographics of what the next um, generation of kids were, were going to be like. So those of us who develop programs could prepare for the challenges that some of those youngsters had for us. So we learned an awful lot from Project PRISM. She also wrote and, and then recently had a second edition of one of the most uh, popular um, textbooks and, and workbooks that we have in our field, Reach Out and Teach. And a lot of you have that on your bookshelf, especially if you work with young kids. And what, what Kay did was talk really about the partnership between teachers and parents and how we had to work together, especially for the very young kids, to make that, to make success happen for them. And um, so those are, those are two of the accomplishments I, I just want to emphasize. The, um, as one of her students, 
uh, I could tell you that I think Madeline and Julie would agree with me that Kay was a model of leadership for us. Uh, working, working under her, uh, well, she was tough. <laughs> and, and I think rigor is the word we use a lot to talk about it. And I can tell you personally, every time I tried to take the easy way out, it didn't, didn't happen. Uh, and there were a lot of those, I think. Um, but um, she, she also um, helped us through her compassion, her honesty, her humor, and her kindness. And she, she really expressed not only that she cared about us and the, and the people we were going to be serving, but all of the people in our, in our business, and, um, and, and the, the kids and the families in particular. And so um, I know I became a principal while I was in graduate school with Kay at Teachers College, and I, I was taking over a school where more than half of the teachers had just resigned. And she knew the school, and I asked her for advice, and she said, everybody there needs to be treated with respect and dignity. And, and I, I've, I've remembered those two words throughout my career because everybody needs that, and certainly in a school we need that. Um, the other thing that happened to me there is when I, took, when I started working with Kay, she was president of the Division on Visual Impairments of Council for Exceptional Children, and she really impressed upon us the need to, um, to get involved with our professional organizations. And later, when I became president of the Division on Visual Impairments, and they took us for training, and they talked about your volunteer uh, uh, efforts for, for the division, I thought, volunteer? I thought I was obliged to do this. I think that's what Kate taught me. <laughs> um, so her, Kay's emphasis on assuring that our programs prioritize dignity and respect and, the, and working with families had a lasting impact on my, my career in practice and on many of us in, in, here today. And uh, I, think, I think Kay at her core is a great teacher and I consider myself very lucky to have been her student. I give you Dr. Farrell. I just looked at the plaque and it says 1948 dash, so I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Make it my Pass my speech. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. There's nothing better than having your students nominate you for an award. For the past nine months, Stuart and I have been talking on the phone or we've been sending emails, mostly talking about baseball and about my grandson who's in college in California. Never once did he even hint at what he was plotting, so. And I have to tell you that Bill Weiner's call was on my telephone while I was in the dentist office in the lobby. I hesitated to answer it because <laughs> I didn't know how soon I was going to go in. And I had not seen Bill for years, so I had no idea why he was calling me. I do want to share that my dental appointment went considerably better since I was already numb. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank my family for being here today. My, many of you know my husband, Richard Gibney, who I met 54 years ago and married 42 years ago. 54 years ago, married 42 years ago, and who was my best friend, confidant, literature searcher, and editor, even editing my speech last, late last night until 12.45. <laughs> Our daughter, Galena Leaphart, who many of you may have met as a child, she's now a civil and structural engineer and vice president of her company. Her company 
will be one of those uh, repairing the causeway to Sanibel Island in Florida. She makes us proud every day. I apologize, though, to Richard and Galena for the many days that I missed out on because I was at a conference or grading papers or staying up all night to meet a grant deadline or going to the all-night post office to mail the, a grant proposal before the deadline. Luckily, I was there when my grandson, Benjamin, was born. He's named after my father, which makes me very proud. And Ben would probably be here if baseball didn't take precedence. Also here today is Galena's boyfriend, Anthony Pisano, He's waving over there. And I, I've only seen you in a suit one other time, and that was your daughter's wedding. So thank you. I'm very impressed. <laughs> I'm happy that he's here because he brought happiness back into Galena's life, made her smile again, and who graciously helps us when we need him. He also brought his two daughters into the family with him, and they have enriched our lives greatly. I promised my niece, Nanette, that I would mention her, even though she is in court in New Jersey today. Nanette is a law guardian for the state of New Jersey. She has seen things we can't even imagine and somehow manages to put families back together. I'm almost certain, though, that she would rather be here. Almost certain. And may I also congratulate Trisha Zorn Hudson, not only for being inducted into the Hall of Fame, but for marrying well. Her husband is the son of Eileen Hudson, one of the founding parents of NAPFI, and I met her back in 1982. It's good to renew an old acquaintance after 40 years, especially here at the Hall of Fame induction. I have had the privilege of knowing, working with, or meeting over one-third of the members of the Hall of Fame. I nominated five of them. I know I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Stuart, for Ju Julie Durando, and Madeline Millian three of my doctoral learners, and for the support letters of Kathy Hubner and Diane Wormsley, Dean Tuttle and George Zimmerman. Thank you to each of them. I came into this field as a secretary for a blind attorney, Harold Krentz, author of To Race the Wind and subject of the Broadway play and movie Butterflies Are Free. He was also a White House fellow under President Ronald Reagan. Hal first rose to national prominence when he was reclassified, reclassified 1A during the Vietnam War. He called a press conference and told those in attendance that he would be happy to serve as long as someone would point the gun in the right direction. It was his idea that I should teach blind students. He thought I would be hard on them. I've often thought about what he meant by that, and I like to think he meant that I would not see blindness as a limitation and that I would have expectations for children with visual impairments. Working with Hal, I knew what was possible. I never even saw limitations. He could direct me to the exact page he wanted to check in the US code or a Supreme Court decision. During the blackouts that were common that summer in Washington, DC, he delighted in guiding his colleagues around the office. My husband, who thought he was humoring the blind guy when challenged to a game of air hockey, was beaten to a pulp quite quickly. <laughs> I only worked with Hal for four months prior to his Rotary Fellowship in England, but he changed my life. When the office manager assumed that I would want to, to continue my work with the blind, Hal was enraged. The office manager was fired shortly thereafter and I was offered her job. As I stand here today, it occurs to me that I have been attending annual meetings for 40, I have been attending annual meetings for 45 years, longer than I've been married. And I started teaching before the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act first became law. This is a sobering thought, since many of you have never known a time without idea governing your work. I am of the generation that would order textbooks in January for the next school year only to have the school system adopt a different textbook over the summer, so I ended up railing one chapter at a time myself until the Braille book arrived. Many of you in the room probably missed that delightful experience. But now we have NIMAS and NIMAC, Bookshare, Braille translation programs, and bossers in our office. Even if a book doesn't arrive in time, we can produce Braille much faster than we used to. 
During my career, I have thought of myself as a collaborator, a catalyst, and even a conspirator. conspirator. For example, I could not have conducted any of my research studies without the collaboration of colleagues and families. I have collaborated on grants. The families and people with disabilities that invited me into their homes and their lives were collaborators too. It has been a privilege to know and work with them. As a catalyst, I have tried to get my doctoral learners to think about things a different way or suggest a different way of doing things and always, always to approach blindness and deafblindness as a possibility, not a limitation. Like our keynote speaker yesterday, I too think words mean something. Every time I hear compensatory skills, I cringe. Compensatory means, quote, reducing or offsetting the unpleasant or unwelcome effects of something. What does that say to our students and our clients? that we teach communication skills because blindness is so unwelcome, because blindness is something we would never want for ourselves. What, I, what Leona called ocular centrism, I called visual imperialism in a position paper I wrote 20 years ago. I am a child of the 60s after all. I want my doctoral students to be graduates themselves, to challenge the assumptions, and to ask what's next. They have done that. They are my legacies. And would my legacies please stand? We have a whole table of UNC people back there. And Madeline and Julie, could you stand as well? And Stuart. <laughs> Thank you. They are my gift to the field. I have often conspired with others behind the scenes, such as with NCLVI or hosting a national Braille conference, or analyzing the state of research in our field, or encouraging others to take the lead while I provided support. Sometimes I even conspired with some people in this room, but those stories are probably, probably best left, left for another time. Teaching has been my joy. One of my first infants in Virginia when I was a teacher grew up to marry one of my University of Northern Colorado master's students. Where else does that happen except in teaching? However, I never intended to be a teacher. As part of the second wave of the women's movement, I thought teaching was what you did if you couldn't do anything else. But it was Harold Krentz, blind Harold Krentz, who changed my mind. Bobby Kennedy, during his race for um, the president back in 68, often quoted George Bernard Shaw, 1968, that is, people. George Bernard Shaw wrote, there are those that see things the way they are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. Where would we be if we didn't dream of what we could do, how we could change the world, how we could change the questions we ask, how children with visual impairment could be included into every family, school, and community activity. There would be no NAPFI or NOPVC. There would be no NCLVI or NLCSD. There would be no, no, no national plan for training personnel, no Bookshare or Benetech, no NIMAS or NIMAC, no Reach Out and Teach, no Babies Count, no Project PRISM, no online education for teachers or for students. No Opticon, no Sonic Guide, no talking books, no refreshable Braille, no technology as we know it today or wish for for tomorrow. No audio description. No young people or women in positions of leadership. No acknowledgement or realization that blind and low vision adults can be partners in the education of children. No Cogswell, Cogswell Macy Bill. No building on patterns. No merger of AEV, AEVH and AAWB into AER. No expanded core curriculum. No rapprochement between consumers and, and professionals like we saw this morning. All of this happened in my 49 years in the field. It couldn't have happened without our collective green our collective dreams and our shared struggles. I am well aware that all of us stand on the shoulders of others. 
Susan Spungen, Geraldine Scholl, Josephine Taylor, Berna Hart, and Betsy Zaborowski were strong role models for me, helped form my career, and set the standards I chose to emulate. Two of them are in the Hall of Fame. I also stood on the shoulders of Bob Bowers, Phil Hatlin, Richard Jackson, Ken Jernigan, Dean Tuttle, Jim Morkey, and Max Woolley, three of whom, four of whom are in the Hall of Fame. My contemporaries, many of whom are in this room, have also been instrumental in my career. We have laughed, cried, argued, and worked together, maybe even conspired a little. They may not be in the Hall of Fame yet, but some will be. Toni Morrison said in 1981, if you find a book you really want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. That is my challenge to all of you. Imagine the possibilities, challenge the assumptions, work together to ask questions and conduct research, find new ways of reaching out to families and collaborating with consumers, and dream about how the world could be so that you can write that next book, maybe not today, but soon. Thank you to the Board of Governors of the Hall of Fame, the American Printing House for the Blind, Craig, Mike Hudson, uh, Laura Huff, is Laura here? Laura, she's still talking to me after all my emails. <laughs> and Andrew Dakin, who not only did this, designed the plaque, but worked with me on the BAME test of basic concepts, designing all of the forms. And the people who nominated. To me, this is the Nobel Prize in Education for persons serving le learners who are blind or visually impaired. It's not in Sweden, but it is in Louisville. I am honored, humbled, and still a little numb. Thank you all. Kay has educated so many instructors, has added so much to our body of knowledge. We thank you. Trisha Zorn Hudson was nominated by Molly Quinn, who couldn't be with us tonight. Mike Bina, Vice Chair of the Board of Governors of the Hall, has agreed to present the award to Trisha. Dr. Bina retired as President of the Maryland School for the Blind in 2018. He currently teaches O&M part-time in Pender County, North Carolina Public Schools. He has served in leadership positions at the Texas, Indiana, Hadley, Perkins, and Maryland Schools for the Blind. Dr. Bina is a past International AER and Council of Schools for the Blind President. Mike will be telling us about Trisha Zorn Hudson. Mike. Hi, Jack. Congratulations, Kay. Thank you, Dr. Weiner, for this privilege to introduce a legend, a leader, and an exemplar, Trisha Zorn Hudson who served on the USABA and the Indiana Blind Children's Foundation uh, with me. Trish is here with her husband, Brian, who is a physician's assistant and a former Wisconsin school student of mine. I'm very proud, Brian. Her mother-in-law, Trisha's mother-in-law, Eileen Hudson, is also here today. Eileen, many of you know, is a founder of NAPVI, the National Association of Parents of the Visually Impaired. Record books show that Michael Phelps won an impressive 28 Olympic medals. Absolutely amazing. But even more amazing is that Michael Phelps' incredible feat was surpassed by a woman, Tricia Zorn Hudson, who in international competition won 55 medals. Doing the math, that's twice as many medals as Michael Phelps an achievement that will never be surpassed. Trish downplays 
her achievements spanning seven Paralympic Games, saying, rather than the medal count, I would rather be remembered for my legacy, because medals don't define a person. They represent the hard work we've done breaking down barriers and positively impacting people. Trisha's true legacy is encouraging hope to those who are the victims and suffer from their own low expectations, who think or others may harmfully think are unable to perform certain tasks due to blindness or low vision. Nominated for the 1988 Sports Illustrated Woman of the Year, in her interview, Trish shared, my motivation lies in the fact that I truly love what I'm doing. Trish describes herself as humble, humbly grateful for her many opportunities, and tenacious, obstinately resolute when people, <laughs> Brian's laughing, her husband, obstinately resolute when people say I couldn't do something, proving that I could. Trish, who as Anna Riddy began swimming at age 10 for the renowned Mission Viejo California Swim Club waters that have spawned many Olympic winners. She was the first low vision athlete to earn an NCAA Division I swimming scholarship, a full ride from the University of Nebraska where she studied to become a special education teacher. And after graduation, taught special education in the Indianapolis public schools for 10 years earning, uh, before earning a law degree from Indiana University. Molly Quinn, USABA CEO, stated, Trish is a charming and warm person with a competitive, contagious spark who is a great Paralympic movement ambassador, using her stardom to serve as a role model for Paralympic athletes and hopefuls. Trish exemplifies the qualities um, of servant leadership, uh, providing pro bono legal services to underserved people who could not afford them, and now is a U.S. Veterans Affair attorney uh, ensuring veterans' benefits. Of this work, Trish stated, the core values of the VA align with my values of I care, an acronym for integrity, commitment, advocacy, respect, and excellence, to work diligently to serve veterans. She continues, and seeing veterans exposed to Paralympic sports after their injuries inspires me. Trish has been inducted into three Paralympic Halls of Fame and now being inducted into the Blindness Hall of Fame, the only two that she has not yet been inducted into are, are you ready for this? I gotta get my notes here. The baseball one in Cooperstown and the NFL one in Canton. But please, please, don't tell Trish that that is impossible. Annually, U.S. Swimming uh, presents the Distinguished Trisha L. Zorn Award, and U.S. presidents have honored her as well as her coaches and teammates. Being handpicked to read the athlete oath at the 1996 Atlanta uh, opening ceremony and the team, and was the team USA's flag bearer in Athens. Lou Moneymaker, a founder of USABA, wrote, equally important as her unbelievable sports achievements were the profound effects she had on others, breaking the Title IX glass ceiling, becoming a role model for uh, women and girl athletes. It was heartening to watch her teach, train, coach, and encourage other women, and particularly young blind girls aspiring to become the next Trisha Zorn. The trickle-down effect that Trisha, in her kind, caring, and humble way, had on women's sports is alive today, an undeniable legacy. Matt Simpson, a two-time Rio and Tokyo uh, goalball Paralympian and lawyer like Trish, has added, the newly built Olympic and Paralympic Museum in Colorado Springs is a gleaming memorial to our most celebrated national heroes, Michael Phelps, Michael Jordan, Jesse Owens, and the miracle on ice. But what struck me the most was that the largest exhibit, two full display cases, were devoted to an amazing blind woman who hundreds of thousands of museum visitors were learning about for the first time, Tricia Zorn Hudson, and through her were introduced to an enlightened understanding of blindness. Mr. Simpson continued, I owe a personal debt of gratitude to Trish for inspiring me and as a role model, not just in the United States, but the world, who continues to serve as an unflagging champion of the cause of blindness and low vision. 
just as much out of the pool as in it, which alone is a laudable feat. This simply cannot be overstated, having inspired generations of young students and athletes, blind and sighted alike, and her story will continue to do uh, so for many, many years to come. Trish, for your representing the United States of America so admirably, with humility, serving as an exemplar and role model worldwide, trailblazing in, a, in an in a blip, a uplifting wake in big waves of high expectations, we are all, all very most grateful. Therefore, as a well-deserved expression of our gratitude, Trish, the Blindness Field is honored to induct you into the Leaders and Legends Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and congratulate Trisha Zorn Hudson. Trish, on your marks, get set, boom. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Mr. Dr. Bina, for the kind words. Um, starting out, I apologize for my voice. Um, when I heard about this, um, apparently they wanted somebody, the universe wanted a challenge for me uh, to talk. So here it goes. Um, uh, and also, I should have brought my sunglasses. But um, anyways, uh, first I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bina, the Board of Governors for the nomination, uh, American Printing House uh, for the Blind, and uh, all the other board members who nominated me, who took the consideration of uh, looking at my, not just my accomplishments in the pool or in my pro uh, sporting career, but also in my professional career. Um, and congratulations, Kay, for everything that you've done. Thank you. You've been a true um, inspiration to me and to all those who you touch every day. Thanks. Um, as of you, a lot of you out there are educators. I was at one time when I, got, when I first um, found out about this award, I had to do some reflection. And I saw myself as a young girl sitting in my house as an elementary, in elementary school and figuring out what I wanted to do. I had been told by several teachers, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that because you can't see. Or my mom was told when I was, at, when I was first born and diagnosed with, my, with aniridia that I would be, have to be institutionalized, that I wouldn't be able to amount to anything. And as that young girl being impressioned and having no idea of the cruel world out there growing up, I had to make a decision. And I didn't know what that decision was because I was innocent, I didn't know. But internally I made that decision that I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to change the world, but I didn't know what that change was. And that change was, I want to show people that, I want to show that stigma that people put on people who are blind and visually impaired, that they are able to break that barrier and to be able to accomplish those goals. So as a young child growing up, I had that support. I was very blessed to have that support, that core group of people to push me through the hard times and the good times, but a lot of hard times. As a young child growing up, I didn't know what I wanted really to, to do in life outside of swimming. I mean, I mean, being from California, all I wanted to do is go to the beach. So, when I was swimming, you know, there was hard times growing, when, when I was swimming and going, my coaches had to learn. It was a learning experience. I was the student 
my coaches were the teachers. I taught them, they taught me. We had this pack, this pack in the school that I wanted to be the best at what I can be and to be the best version of myself. And through swimming, I was able to be able to define that and be able to describe and show people that it didn't matter, that I couldn't see. I couldn't see the end of the pool. I couldn't see the clock. I couldn't see the scoreboard, but that didn't matter. Because my actions in the pool, I wanted to resonate among other people. I wanted to show those people who were doubters, who didn't think that the possible, the impossible was possible. And I had that platform of swimming to be able to show that. And I'm very grateful for that. And in school, when I was in school, I finally decided, and I think, Kay, you said it very graciously, you know, there are certain things that people put on, stigmas that people put on us who have visual impairments. And as I was going and deciding what I wanted to be when I grew up, I was like, ooh, being in the legal field, that's pretty cool. But it was, oh no, you can't do that. That's too hard. That's too much reading. You can't do that. So I went into education. I was told, oh, you can do that. You just have to talk. You just have to assign work. You can do that. Not much reading. So there it was. After graduation from high school, I went to the University of Nebraska. Best experience, not the best weather, but the best experience for education. Um, so I graduated um, from college, and then I decided that I wanted to continue, continue swimming, so I did, and uh, learned more, and more about myself, and also, you know, learned really what medals were all about. Because as a young kid, you're thinking, oh, winning medals is the best thing. That's great, but it's not. As I said, and Dr. Rena said it, medals don't define me. Medals don't define anybody. It's the hard work, the dedication, and the impact that you have on those people who are watching you get those medals. It's to be able to see the gratitude of those people, coaches, parents, your other support network, get excited of what your accomplishments were in, during those moments. But when I was, when I, once I graduated from college and thought about that, I thought, well, you know what, I want to I wanna still continue, because I was thinking about retiring from swimming, and then I wanted to continue, so I did, and that's when I, I went to my final games. But then again, I was like, ooh, going back retrospectively to when I was a kid, ooh, law school sounds pretty cool. So that's when I decided that I wanted to go to law school. I wanted to make another impact when I retired from my sporting career and make an impact on those people. That was my dream, was to be an inspiration and an impact to those people who are blind or visually impaired to who come behind me. Those young kids that I have maybe touched when I was teaching. Those young kids that I coached when I, after, when I was coaching swimming. And then when I was teaching my former teachers, I went to law school. Can't say it was the greatest experience, but it was okay. <laughs> Just being real. But I graduated from uh, nobody, and at this time, I was the first, it was shocking to me because this is a law school. And I was the first 
disabled or visually impaired student that they had. I had to teach them what I needed to be successful. It was a struggle, but it was a learning experience for both of us. And it ended up being a positive experience. And I impacted a lot of people at that time. And now, currently, I work for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Best job I could ever have. Love working and, hate and making an impact and talking to veterans who come back and say, I can't do anything that I did before I was injured. Yes, you can. You just have to make sure, you may have to adapt, and you may have to do things differently, but you are worth it. You are able, and you are capable of doing everything that you want to do. So there's, that's my story. Medals, 41 gold. People say, that's fantastic. That's awesome. But to me, you, could, you can't put a value on me. I can't put a value on touching people's lives and being an inspiration to those who come behind me. And with this, being inducted into the Hall of Fame, this is eternity. This is something that people will see and walk and touch, and it's impactful. And I am in, I am extremely grateful and humbled by your consideration. And again, thank you so much, and um, I hope you all have a great rest of your conference. Thank you. Trish, you truly have touched so many lives. You're, you're quite the inspiration to all of us. Thank you. One more round of applause for both of our honorees.